day, everyone. Welcome to today's Bradnet Incorporated First Quarter 2020 Financial Results Conference. Today's conference is being recorded. At this time, I'd like to turn things over to Mr. Mark Stolper, Executive Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Bradnet. Please go ahead. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for joining Dr. Howard, Ber- Howard Berger and me today to discuss Radnet's first quarter 2020 financial results. Before we begin today, we'd like to remind everyone of the safe harbor statement under the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. This presentation contains forward-looking statements within the meaning of the U.S. Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995. Specifically, statements concerning anticipated future financial and operating performance and liquidity, our response to and the effect of the expected future impact of COVID-19, our ability to stabilize and continue to grow the business by generating patient referrals and contracts with radiology practices, recruiting and retaining radiologists and technologists, consummating acquisitions and joint ventures, receiving third-party reimbursement for diagnostic imaging services, successfully integrating acquired operations, generating revenue and adjusted EBITDA for the acquired operations as estimated, among others, are forward-looking statements within the meaning of the safe harbor. Forward-looking statements are based on management's current preliminary expectations and are subject to risks and uncertainties which may cause RADnet's actual results to differ materially from the statements contained herein. These risks and uncertainties include those risks set forth in RADnet's reports filed with the SEC from time to time, including RADnet's annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2019, and our quarterly report on Form 10-Q for the quarter ended March 31, 2020. Undue reliance should not be placed on forward-looking statements, especially guidance on future financial performance, which speaks only as of the date it is made. Radnet undertakes no obligation to update publicly any forward-looking statements to reflect new information, events or circumstances after the date they were made, or to reflect the occurrence of unanticipated events. And with that, I'd like to turn the call over to Dr. Berger. Thank you, Mark. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. On today's call, Mark and I plan to provide you with highlights from our first quarter 2020 results, give you more insight into factors which affected this performance, and discuss our future strategy. After our prepared remarks, we will open the call to your questions. I'd like to thank all of you for your interest in our company and for dedicating a portion of your day to participate in our conference call this morning. Before we start, I just wanted to say on behalf of myself and the entire RADNET team, we hope that all of you are safe and your families are healthy and doing well. We know this has been a difficult and challenging time for everyone around the world, and we are extremely grateful for all of our stakeholders, including our employees, business partners, lenders, and shareholders. We are wishing you all of the best. Today's prepared remarks will be a bit of a departure from what we usually highlight during our financial results call. This morning, Mark and I will focus on giving you an understanding of what we have been facing under COVID-19, the actions that we have taken to reduce costs and conserve cash, our current and projected liquidity position, our thoughts on our anticipated recovery, and some discussion around the post-COVID operating opportunity. I'd like to start off by giving you a status update on where our business stands and how it has been impacted by COVID-19. After having strong operating results in January and February, months that performed ahead of our original internal operating plan, we began to see our volumes drop dramatically beginning the third week of March. This is when we began to take swift and decisive, decisive actions to sustain our business through a potentially prolonged period of time during which we could face a material drop in procedural volume. We analyzed all aspects of our business and focused on ways to most effectively reduce our cash spend. We created a multi-pronged plan to impact major expenses, 
expenses and cash flow categories. Specifically, we created a plan to reduce salaries and professional fees by 50% and lower our facilities' rental payments by close to 70%. We investigated every local market in which we operate to identify centers we could temporarily close and where we felt with a high degree of confidence we could direct patient volume into facilities that would remain open. We also evaluated our large categories of cash cash spend and identified vendors that would work with us to lower our costs or defer payments. Our goal was that by early April, we would have most of our cost savings and cash conservation measures instituted. I am pleased to report that we have been successful in achieving this goal. First, we analyzed all of our 335 locations and identified sites in our clustered approach that could be temporarily closed and whose business could be consolidated into nearby facilities. By temporarily closing facilities and redirecting their patient flow to other RADnet sites, we were able to save on employee costs, utilities, repairs and maintenance, and other center-level operating costs, all while preserving the revenue we were going to recognize at the closed sites. Our clustering and geographically concentrated approach to market penetration has greatly helped us during this period. We have been able to close 97 of our locations, representing almost 30% of our facilities. Our central scheduling departments have been effective in directing all patient flow to facilities that remain open. Temporarily closing these facilities has enabled us to furlough about 3,600 employees of our roughly 8,600 in our total workforce. The furloughed staff remains employed employed by RADnet, and we continue to fund their benefit plans and health care expense. However, we have ceased paying their salaries and corresponding employee taxes, and these employees are eligible to collect unemployment benefits from federal and state-funded programs. We are in frequent communication with these furloughed employees, and we are committed to bringing them back to the work in a methodical way as soon as our volume allows us to gradually reopen our facilities. In addition to the furloughs, we cut the salaries of the vast majority of non-center-level employees who remain working. These cuts were led by our executive management team and salaried physicians who are taking 50% reductions in their salaries. Below the executive management level, salary reductions range from 5 to 25%. As a result of these actions, we have met our goal of a 50% decrease of our salaries and professional fee expenses and associated cash burn. Our landlords have also greatly contributed to our cash conservation measures. Most of our landlords have agreed to three to six month full or partial deferrals of rent payments and most are providing us 6 to 12 months to repay these deferrals. As a result, our cash expenditures for rent payments in the second quarter has been reduced by almost 70%. Additionally, all of our lessors, lessors with whom we have operating leases on equipment, including OEMs and third-party finance companies, have agreed to restructure rental payments to let us to allow us starting with the payment we would have made in April to the first six payments and add these amounts to the back-end buyout of the leased equipment. Additionally, we have suspended all new capital projects. The vast majority of capital expenditures we will make during the remainder of the year are either for capital equipment already delivered to the company or construction that was substantially completed prior to April for which we currently owe money. In addition to the traditional fixed cost and cash outflows, which I have discussed, rent to rent, employees, etc., our variable expenses have also decreased with the lower procedural volumes. The most significant, significant of these variable outflows are payments we make to our third-party contracted radiology groups, which generally are a function of re- revenue and procedural volumes. We typically pay our third-party radiology groups in the neighborhood of 15 to 20 percent of our cash collections to interpret our exams. 
As a result of lower payments from RadNet, our contracted groups have taken actions to manage their staffing levels and control their own costs. We have remained in close dialogue with all our contracted radiology groups and are confident that they, like RadNet, are all taking the appropriate measures to ensure their health and survival through the COVID-19 environment. Each contracted group has a plan to restaff our facilities as appropriate when revenues and volumes begin to return to normal levels. Other variable expenses that have adjusted with the revenues and procedural volumes include medical and pharmacy supplies, utilities, equipment repair and maintenance, and certain employee-related expenses such as travel, meals, and other employee expense reimbursement items. All these expenses and cash outflows have now adjusted more than proportionate to our lower procedural volume levels. Contributing to our strong liquidity position were payments we received subsequent to the end of the first quarter under the CARES Act and from Medicare. Specifically, we received almost $15 million under the first $30 billion appropriation of the Coronas Aid, Relief, and Economic Security Act, or CARES Act. This allocation to RADNET was calculated based upon our share of overall Medicare billings relative to all Medicare providers during 2019. Subject to our compliance with future reporting requirements, we do not anticipate being required to repay this money. A second $20 billion appropriate, appropriated under the CARES Act was announced two weeks ago. We, we were asked by CMS to submit tax returns evidencing our overall collections during 2018, and we believe there may be additional allocation to us from this $20 billion appropriation that could be based on our proportion of the overall annual U.S. healthcare spend, currently estimated at about $2.6 trillion. At this time, it is too early and speculative to estimate the amounts we may receive. We should have more information about this appropriation in the coming weeks. In addition to the grant we already received under the CARES Act, we received almost $40 million in accelerated Medicare advance payments. This money is to be repaid to CMS in getting 120 days from its receipt and shall be repaid through the adjudication of future Medicare services we provide over a three-month period. We anticipate this money to be substantially repaid during the third and fourth quarters of this year. So how bad did our volumes get? And where are our, our procedural volumes today? As I mentioned earlier, volumes began to dramatically decline by the third week of March. They continued to decline as more states and local municipalities adopted stay-at-home orders and related policies. Our volumes hit a trough during mid-April, whereby we were down almost 85% on the East Coast and 65% on the West Coast relative to our original operating budget. The New York tri-state area was impacted the hardest, while California's impact was and has been less. I'm very happy to say that our volumes have materially improved over the past several weeks, whereby our procedural volumes are down on a blended East and West Coast basis, about 40% as of today. We expect this to improve as stay-at-home orders are lifted. Already, governors in several states in which we operate are allowing for non-emergent medical procedures to be performed. One thing I should mention in regards to the impact on procedural volumes and revenue from COVID-19 is that our capitation business has really been a bright spot because under our capitated arrangements, we get paid a fixed amount per enrollee managed by the medical groups with whom we capitate. Our capitation revenue and the associated cash flow has remained constant during the COVID-19 period, despite being required to perform fewer services for these patient populations during this period. Enrollment for these HMO patients with our contracted medical groups has remained intact as patients and their employees, even for those who have been furloughed, have continued to pay health care premiums. 
The predictability of this capitated revenue and cash flow has benefited us more than ever before during this period. Before I turn the call over to Mike to discuss the financials, I'd just like to take this moment to recognize our workforce. The real heroes from MadNet have been our center-level employees and their managers who continue to come to work each day to service our medical communities and patients in need. To keep our patients and employees safe, we instituted new operating protocols. These include added viral waiting room capabilities, excuse me, virtual waiting room capabilities, which allow patients to be called or texted for their exam when they, while they sit safely in their cars. We have also provided personal protective equipment for all employees and patients and have created as sterile environment as possible. I am certainly grateful that these employees and RAMNET as a company can play an important role in an unprecedented time. I look forward to bringing back our full load workforce and reopening our close facilities as increasing patient volume dictates. At this time, I'd like to turn the call back over to Mark to discuss some of the highlights of our first quarter 2020 performance. When he is finished, I will make some closing remarks. Thank you, Howard. I'm now going to briefly review our first quarter 2020 performance and attempt to highlight what I believe to be some material items. I will also give some further explanation of certain items in our financial statements as well as provide some insights into some of the metrics that drove our first quarter 2020 performance. In my discussion, I will use the term adjusted EBITDA, which is a non-GAAP financial measure. The company defines adjusted EBITDA as earnings before interest, taxes, depreciation, and amortization, and excludes losses or gains on the disposal of equipment, other income or loss, loss on debt extinguishments, and non-cash equity compensation. Adjusted EBITDA includes equity earnings in unconsolidated operations and subtracts allocations of earnings to non-controlling interest in subsidiaries and is adjusted for non-cash or extraordinary and one-time events taking place during the period. A full quantitative reconciliation of adjusted EBITDA to net income or loss attributable to Radnet Inc. common shareholders is included in our earnings release and our current report on Form 8K filed with the SEC. With that said, I'd now like to review our first quarter results. For the first quarter of 2020, RadNet reported revenue of $281.6 million and adjusted EBITDA of $20.4 million. Revenue increased $10 million, or 3.7%, as a result of the contributions from Kern Radiology and Zilka Radiology, a slight business shift in favor of advanced modalities, and increases in reimbursement from capitated and fee-for-service payors. The increase in aggregate revenue was net of a 3.3% decline in same center um, volumes and a 0.6% decrease in aggregate volumes. Adjusted EBITDA decreased $12.7 million, or 38.5%. This was primarily due to the impact of COVID-19, particularly on our same center performance. We estimated that our revenue was reduced by COVID-19 by an estimated $25 million during the quarter, and EBITDA was reduced by approximately $14 million. For the first quarter of 2020, as compared to the prior year's first quarter, MRI volume increased 1.2%, CT volume increased 3.4%, and PET CT volume increased 4%. Overall volume, taking into account routine imaging exams, inclusive of x-ray, ultrasound, mammography, and all other exams, decreased 0.6% from the prior year's first quarter. In the first quarter of 2020, we performed 1,862,498 total imaging procedures. 
The procedures were consistent with our multimodality approach, whereby 76.5% of all the work we did by volume was from routine imaging. Our procedures in the first quarter of 2020 were as follows. Note that the CT volumes for last year have been restated to account for a change we made as of January 1st of this year in how we account for one of our CT CPT codes. The the comparative numbers that follow are on an apples-to-apples basis. 263,055 MRIs as compared with 259,912 MRIs in the first quarter of 2019, 163,082 CTs as compared with 157,679 CTs in the first quarter of 2019, 10,683 PET CTs as compared with 10,273 PET CTs in the first quarter of 2019, and 1,425,678 routine imaging exams, inclusive of x-ray, ultrasound, and mammography, and all other exams, as compared with 1,444,425 of all of these exams in the first quarter of 2019. Net loss for the first quarter of 2020 was $16.4 million, or negative 33 cents per share, compared to a net loss of $3.7 million, or negative 8 cents per share, reported for the three-month period ended March 31, 2019. This is based upon a weighted average number of shares outstanding in the first quarters of 50.3 million shares in 2020 and 49.6 million shares in 2019. Affecting net loss in the first quarter of 2020 were certain non-cash expenses and non-recurring items, including the following. $6.6 million of non-cash employee stock compensation expense resulting from the vesting of certain options in restricted stock. $218,000 of severance paid in connection with headcount reductions related to cost savings initiatives and $1.1 million of non-cash amortization of deferred financing costs and loan discounts related to financing fees paid as part of our existing credit facilities. Overall gap interest expense for the first quarter of 2020 was $11.6 million. This compares with gap interest expense in the first quarter of 2019 of $12.3 million. The lower interest expense results mostly from a lower LIBOR rate relative to last year's first quarter. Cash paid for interest during the period, which excludes non-cash deferred financing expense and accrued interest, was $9.9 million as compared with $10.3 million in the first quarter of last year. With regards to our balance sheet, as of March 31, 2020, Unadjusted for bond and term loan discounts, we had $686.6 million of net debt, which is our total debt at par value less our cash balance. This compares with $679.2 million of net debt as of March 31, 2019. Note that this debt balance includes New Jersey Imaging Network's debt of approximately $57.6 million dollars for which RADNET is neither a borrower nor a guarantor. As of March 31st, 2020, we were um, drawn $80 million on our $137.5 million revolving line of credit and had a cash balance of $94.3 million. Since quarter end, we have repaid our revolver in full, and as of April 30th, had a cash balance of approximately $50 million. As Dr. Berger mentioned in in his prepared remarks, we believe we have little to no cash burn through the end of the second quarter, and we believe that the cost savings and cash conservation measures we have put in place may result in our being undrawn on a revolver at year end and with a meaningful positive cash balance. Although we do not believe we need to raise any additional capital at this time, 
we will continue to evaluate government funding options, such as the Main Street Expanded Loan Facility, should we determine it would be in the best interest of our stakeholders to substantially increase our cash reserves. At March 31, 2020, our accounts receivable balance was $144.2 million, a decrease of $10.5 million from year-end 2019. The decrease in accounts receivable is mainly the result of the dramatic decline in our procedural volumes and revenue in the second half of March, partially mitigated by the longer collection cycle we experienced in the first quarter from the resetting of patient deductibles as of January 1st. Our day sales outstanding, or DSO, was 43.9 days at March 31st, 2020, lower by approximately 0.8 days as of year-end 2019. Through March 31st, 2020, we had total capital expenditures, net of asset dispositions, and sale of imaging center assets and joint venture interests of $50.8 million. Note that each year, we front load the majority of our capital decisions into the first quarter. So CapEx was disproportionately higher in the first half of the year. Most of what we paid for during the first quarter was for equipment delivered to the company or construction projects, projects that were substantially completed before April 1st. As Dr. Berger mentioned in his remarks, we have suspended all new capital projects for the remainder of the year. With respect to Medicare reimbursement for 2020, there is nothing to report at this time. As is typical each year, we are expecting CMS to release a preliminary rate schedule sometime in June or July, at which time we will analyze CMS's proposal and our industry's lobbying group, the Association for Quality Imaging, will provide CMS our industry's feedback. At the time of our second quarter financial results call, we will be in a position to comment on CMS's proposal and its impact, if any, upon RADNET's future results. I'd now like to turn the call back to Dr. Berger, who will make some closing remarks. Thank you, Mark. From adversity often comes opportunity. While COVID-19 has impacted us and everybody else in a very different way, it can also be the catalyst for opportunity. I strongly feel this has been and will continue to be the case for RADNET. First, COVID-19 has caused us to analyze everything we do as a company and evaluate how we deliver our services on what we spend money, how we spend our money, and how we could improve what we do. Through this process of identifying ways to lower expenses and conserve cash, I believe, I believe we have learned things that will change the way we deliver our services and how we manage our business in the future. Without getting too specific, I believe that in a post-COVID environment, we can reduce what we have historically been spending on employee travel and other employee reimbursed expenses. I believe that we will be able to staff our centers and supporting general and administrative functions more efficiently. I believe that we will be able to procure medical supplies, equipment service, and perform general and administrative functions at a lower cost. I also believe that our entire executive management team will benefit from the experience of managing through this very trying period. In addition to improvements in the way we can manage RADNET in the future, I also believe that the post-COVID environment will provide us opportunities to accelerate our growth. As difficult as this period has been for the RAD men, small operators have had an even more challenging time. Most of our competitors are small radiologist-owned operators who lack the scale, capital, and human resources to emerge from the COVID-19 period with the same financial and operating strength than, that we will. As a result, we think that there will be more M&A opportunity for us in the post-COVID period at multiples that will more align with the prices we have paid in the past. Furthermore, for the couple of months, hospitals have focused on COVID-19 and other 
very acute patients. This will continue for some will continue for some time. The vast majority of outpatient business that historically has been performed within the hospitals prior to COVID-19 has shifted to the ambulatory providers such as RedNet. This means that patients and the referring physicians will become accustomed to using outpatient providers, and we don't believe this business will be recaptured by a hospital for some period of time. Ambulatory patients will likely feel more comfortable and safer being directed into freestanding alternatives to hospitals. This could have a material impact on our volumes in the future and could accelerate the existing trend, mostly because of the differential in cost of hospitals losing outpatient business to ambulatory freestanding providers. The acceleration of this trend could also drive more hospitals towards joint ventures and partnerships, which now represents over 25% of all RADNF facilities. Additionally, during this COVID-19 period, telehealth and telemedicine has flourished. I believe this will continue in the post-COVID era. More patients will be availing themselves of telemedical services in the future, and I believe this will be beneficial for RADNET. Because telemedicine does not allow for the traditional physical exam, I believe physicians will order more diagnostic tests and rely on their results for diagnostics and treating their patients at a distance. In particular, I believe this will drive increased utilization of routine imaging, specifically ultrasound and x-ray, as tools that will be utilized earlier in the patient diagnostic staging. Furthermore, I believe in the post-COVID environment, artificial intelligence will have an even more important role in healthcare and population health. Artificial intelligence will be used for identifying high-risk patients for certain chronic diseases, including cancer, diabetes, or ailments that could make them more susceptible to or at risk from future viruses like COVID-19. In the post-COVID-19 era, there will likely be more of an emphasis on screening tools and wellness. Diagnostic imaging will play a critical role in these initiatives. So even in this challenging time, we have cause to be very optimistic about the future of RADNET. RADNET will weather the storm, similar to our experience with the credit crisis and recession beginning in 2008, and we expect to emerge as a stronger and better positioned company in our industry and healthcare in general. Operator, we are now ready for the question and answer portion of the call. Thank you, gentlemen. At this time, if you do have a question, that will be star one. Once again, star one for questions. We'll hear first today from Brian Tenquilla with Jeffries. Hey, good morning, guys. Uh, hope everyone's doing well. Um, Howard, I guess my first question for you, I mean, you kind of alluded to it, but as, as we think about 2021, you know, once we get past COVID and it seems like, you know, we're starting to see uh, a restart or re reignition of, uh, you know, hospital volumes and physician business. So, as I think about, you know, getting past this and assuming that we don't see a second wave, how are you thinking about 2021 in terms of, you know, say, earnings power or you know, volume trends versus where you were, let's just say, you know, early March? Uh, good morning, Brian. Hope you're well and safe. Sounds like you are. Um, thank you for the question. Um, as I mentioned in my closing remarks, uh, I think – uh, we'll all be facing a new definition of normal. And because of, of the po in the post-COVID period, which could easily, in some respects, last into 2021, uh, particularly uh, with the concern about the development of a vaccine, I believe a lot of the mitigation measures and safety procedures will have to be continued. Uh, in that regard, I think more and more patients will look to ambulatory outpatient providers as opposed to going to hospitals uh, for those services. So uh, in that respect, the initiative is often spoken about uh, by the healthcare insurers trying to direct patients away from hospitals primarily 
because of differential in reimbursement will now be heightened because of uh, perceived and probably realistic uh, additional safety measures. Uh, I think that the other thing that, the, that this crisis has really indicated is the need for better population health uh, and management. Uh, the, the crisis has certainly focused on areas of the healthcare delivery system which were inadequately prepared for the patients that got very sick and needed to be hospitalized and had shortages of PPE, including ventilators and other measures, along with uh, sufficient ICU beds and uh, isolation capabilities. But going forward, I think the ability to assess the population health and manage wellness will help reduce the burden on hospitals and make the ability to uh, respond to crisis uh, even easier. Um, where I think, interestingly enough, the outpatient imaging industry fits into this is in the recovery process and reopening towards uh, looking at 2021. Um, as patients begin to uh, dip their toes back into the water of uh, reopening the economy, uh, we're better for uh, our patients and the uh, population to feel comfortable uh, than going to outpatient health care providers that both know how to manage the safety and mitigation risk that they will see in their office in their offices, as well as the need to take advantage of what was delayed health care that can only lead to more costs and more uh, morbidity and mortality in the future. It's interesting that just today uh, an article in the prestiged journal Cancer uh, identified in particular that the risks of mortality for breast cancer in a study that was overseen by uh, Roslo Tabar in Sweden, one of the most uh, respected uh, mammographers in the world, uh, that they saw a 41% decrease in mortality from breast cancer as a result of screening mammography. Uh, the fact that we have had a lot of uh, delayed elective mammograms uh, being put off uh, will only mean that the longer that goes, the more likely that there will be increased after costs uh, and, and morbidity uh, from this. And that's not just in breast cancer, but all forms of other diseases and cancer. So uh, I believe this heightened uh, awareness uh, will help us and will, uh, I think, cause a refocus by everybody, whether it's health healthcare insurers, uh, uh, physicians, uh, and uh, public health officials to look at outpatient uh, ambulatory services and particularly imaging as a critical role in managing, managing the healthcare of our, our population. Now, that, that makes a lot of sense. Howard, one of the things that you mentioned um, in your prepared remarks that kind of piggybacking off of your uh, comments that you just made with, um, a few seconds ago, I think you accelerate geology. You know, clearly, there is a shift or that's happening, and that we're probably sick, you know, from physicians' offices to tele telemedicine in, in some cases, right? So, whether it's a teledoc or just a doc practice using either their own platform or, or just using Zoom and, and FaceTime, how are you, or how do you have to change your marketing strategy, or you know, do you have to partner with someone like a teledoc or an Amwell? to make sure you capture the volumes there um, and also not to lose the share that you have with your existing doctors who are leaving their offices to uh, go virtual? Um, I, I think that um, the role of imaging will be heightened uh, in this period because as doctors do more telehealth, uh, the need to perhaps get some of these uh, diagnostic exams sooner since they will be unable to do typical physical examination, uh, 
uh, use their stethoscopes and other tools, uh, may be best to go ahead and send these patients to the outpatient uh, imaging providers uh, rather than have the patient make uh, another visit into their offices only then to require uh, the, the uh, diagnostic imaging test. Uh, that along with the fact that uh, radiology has been a very early adopter of telehealth by using its PAC systems to be able to uh, use the uh, imaging at, in a remote way will be enhanced uh, by things like artificial intelligence and other technologies that are uh, evolving inside of imaging to provide more targeted and specific diagnostic capability. Um, that along with, I think, the emergence of uh, some of the pharmacies that will be looking to do some of their uh, early patient management and visits uh, in their pharmacies, uh, we believe will also align us uh, with some of these groups to help provide that kind of screening capability on a mass level that uh, has not necessarily been part of the pattern in the past. So I, I think all of these uh, changes, some of which will occur as a result of technology and some of them which will occur simply because of change in patterns of delivery, uh, will be of enormous benefit to RADMAN in the future. Uh, Brian, to, 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 um, for, to expand a little bit more on what Dr. Bergen was saying, a lot of the telehealth that we're seeing today is from local physicians who, you know, have physical um, practices who are trying to service their patient base by um, in doing appointments, you know, via technology. And so those are physicians that we already have a relationship with in our local markets who are familiar with our centers, our referrers, you know, um, you know have been referrers uh, of ours in the past and will continue to be in the future. And those are, um, uh, from a marketing perspective, those are targets of our um, marketing representatives. But to your point, you know, to the extent that medicine is going to be delivered by, you know, more centralized um, teledocs that may not be actually physically located in, in our markets, then we're going to need to establish some of those relationships with those larger companies like the, couple, the, the two that you mentioned um, so that they're aware of the services that we provide um, and, you know, our quality and our access in the markets where their patients, you know, may reside, which which are, you know, which could be very different from where the doctor is located. So it will ultimately require us to have relationships with some of these larger centralized uh, physician practices. That makes sense. And then last question for me, Mark. Um, you know, you paid down your revolver after the quarter. Um, you know, obviously, I, I know you were you did a good job preparing the company for the worst case scenario, thinking that you know you, you had enough cash, even if volumes were down, the April levels for for a year, right? So, what was the mindset behind paying it down as soon as you did, given you know what could be viewed as ongoing uncertainty related to COVID? Sure, sure. Um, well, some of the benefit of of living. Uh, through the credit crisis, you know, back in 2008, 9, 10 time frame was that, you know, there, there, there was a liquidity crunch um, at the time and um, companies were extremely concerned um, with um, their bank's abilities to fund uh, um, committed revolvers. And, and if you remember at that time, there were a number of banks that um, were unable to fund or unwilling to fund um, revolvers that were committed at the time, and that created serious liquidity problems um, for companies during that period of time. When this, uh, when the COVID uh, um, period started, we were concerned with, um, you know, the stability of the banking system. We were uh, unaware at that time of. of how um, effective the federal government was going to be um, with um, providing liquidity in, in the banking institutions and, 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 and backing up the banks if they needed 
um, for the liquidity. And so we pulled down, and you can see at, at uh, quarter end, we were $80 million drawn on a revolver, not because we needed the money, but because we were concerned with our ability to access that capital if something were to happen in the banking system. Um, as the federal government has provided, you know, tremendous liquidity into the marketplace, um, our concerns about our ability to access our revolver um, went away, and so we decided to pay back, um, you know, the remaining balance on our um, uh, on our revolving line of credit, um, um, uh, partially because we didn't want to pay the negative carry on the interest expense, and and uh, um, we had confidence that we we would be able to attack that liquidity should we need it in the future, which, by the way, I don't think we will. Got it. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Ryan. Again, star one for questions at this time. We'll hear next from Mitra Ramgopal with Sidoti. Yes, hi. Uh, good morning. Thanks for taking the questions. I uh, just wanted to follow up uh, on liquidity. Uh, clearly, uh, the cash conservation was a primary focus as a result of COVID-19, and given that things are stabilized, uh, I know, Howard, you've said, indicated you've seen some M&A opportunities that might not have existed before. I'm just trying to get a sense in terms of um, the thinking behind um, the cash conservation versus maybe uh, pursuing some M&A opportunities. Well, I think uh, cash conservation and keeping our liquidity is of the foremost concern. And uh, based on our projections through the end of the year, uh, we're quite comfortable that that liquidity uh, will be quite substantial and perhaps the best in the company's history. Part of that will be watching the return of our volumes and making certain that we balance uh, our costs, uh, such as uh, salaries and other spending, uh, commensurate with the increase in volume and not get, uh, to use the expression, too far over the tips of our skis where we uh, get concerned again about uh, liquidity. So over the next, uh, the balance of this quarter and going into the third quarter, um, to the extent that uh, our liquidity uh, maintains the levels that we've projected uh, through the end of the year, uh, we will then be judicious in looking at uh, acquisitions that may, in fact, uh, help us uh, further enhance our our strategy uh, in the markets that we're in. Uh, perhaps expand uh, joint ventures with our hospital partners, uh, and maybe even if they're properly uh, acquired, uh, be further deleveraging for that for us. Uh, I also want to add one other comment to uh, Mark. Uh, discussion about liquidity, uh, we are also going to be benefiting and, and have started immediately from the lower cost of borrowing. Uh, our, our, our big debt for our credit facility is a LIBOR-based uh, uh, borrowing uh, with a 1% floor uh, prior to the uh, uh, prior to, or subsequent to the first quarter, uh, that borrowing was well above uh, the 1% floor, which caused us, which ca caused us a much higher interest payment uh, that we made in early April. Uh, since then, we have elected uh, LIBOR borrowing, which we believe through the balance of this year will be well below the 1% and probably will be a cash flow savings to the company of perhaps uh, $5 million dollars. Uh, for the balance of this year. So uh, all of those will get factored into our uh, overall cash management, uh, as it always does, but with more of a, uh, an eye on making certain that the volumes which we expect and are already seeing uh, beginning to return uh, are, are used to measure our liquidity and uh, cost conservation. <clears throat> so that being said, um, we're always looking and are always approached about uh, acquisitions and new joint ventures, uh, and we will use uh, basically our cash liquidity as the benchmark as 
as to the wisdom of doing uh, some of these uh, new acquisitions and joint ventures. Okay, that's great. Uh, thanks for the uh, call up. Um, also, just on the, um, I think you'd mentioned there are about 70 uh, locations that were temporarily closed. I um, just want to get a sense as to um, when you think uh, you might be able to reopen all of those facilities or locations, or do you anticipate maybe some may not uh, be reopened? Uh, actually, the number of facilities, Mitra, is closer to 100. It's 97 that are closed as we speak right here. Uh, we will continue. We don't anticipate at this time um, closing permanently any of those facilities. Uh, all those facilities were necessary before COVID-19 based on access uh, and uh, based on the volumes that uh, we produce. Uh, since we expect those volumes will eventually return and access in our markets are extremely important for uh, the payors and our physician refers, uh, we expect to keep virtually all of those uh, centers open and bring back all of our full uh, employees in a very measured way over the next uh, 90 to 180 days. We're monitoring uh, volume by center, and to the extent that any center or any market starts having backlogs because the demand starts coming back for, um, you know, for these types of diagnostic services, we'll start opening um, methodically um, centers one by one to try to fill that demand, you know, up, up to the point where there's a full recovery. So um, we're going to do it, you know, uh, on, center, on a center-by-center center basis if it's based upon the volumes that we're seeing in our uh, imaging centers. Okay. No, that's great. Um, and I believe uh, you, you mentioned you, on the capitation um, and future service, uh, you did see um, some price increasing in, in the first quarter. Just wondering um, if you can give us a sense of uh, how meaningful that was for you. Uh, well, some, most of these increases were already contractually provided for. Uh, we had a series of renegotiations of our capitation uh, arrangements in 2019, and throughout this year, uh, we will be seeing increases as the anniversary dates of those contracts uh, occur. I think mean, going into this year, uh, the overall increases that we've experienced so far are probably in the 5 to 6% range, uh, and through the remainder of this year, uh, we expect another perhaps uh, 2 or 3% increase. Uh, increase in our capitation rates uh, spread out uh, through the remainder of this year. Okay, thanks. And then finally, um, just back on the expansion uh, plans, um, if you can give us an update on the uh, where we are on the deep health acquisition and also um, on the Pulse Pro installations. I assume those are probably going to, at least on the Pulse Pro, that might be delayed given the environment. Yes, I think uh, the Pulse projects uh, are delayed not so much because we want to delay them, but simply because uh, until the, uh, the more uh, non-emergent work uh, increases, particularly as it results to uh, prostate cancer and the uh, urologists and other uh, specialists that, that see these patients uh, begin to ramp up, uh, clearly we will have a delay uh, in that, but we're very enthusiastic about uh, the Tulsa project and prostate cancer in general, uh, which we believe uh, in the upcoming uh, perhaps 12 to 18 months may evolve into, uh, similar to um, mammography, uh, more of a screening procedure that we believe can be performed on a uh, mass population basis Rather than, rather than just waiting for individuals to have signs indicative that they, must, uh, that they might have prostate cancer. So um, a lot of our focus, both in terms of uh, artificial intelligence, uh, as well as conversations with the payors uh, to revisit uh, prostate uh, as, and perhaps transition it into a screening tool along with other areas like colon cancer and lung cancer, 
uh, will be a, a major focus uh, for us uh, uh, going into the latter part of uh, this year. Okay, thanks. Take any questions. Thank you, Mike. Sure. Stay safe. And from Raymond James, we'll hear next from John Ransom. Hey, uh, good morning. Um, what are you doing, if anything, on your, your intake? It, it seems like uh, people probably don't want to be hanging around and, or in, you know, waiting to get scanned. Uh, can you do anything to uh, do more real-time patient sequencing so that we're not uh, having people sit in waiting rooms, or is that something uh, down your list of things to do? Sure. Um, one of the things that we've instituted, which is um, something that we are contemplating continuing into the, you know, into the future, um, potentially permanently, are virtual waiting rooms so that patients are able to check in, um, fill out uh, the intake forms digitally, either on their phone or, if, uh, or we can give them an iPad, and then go back to their cars and sit in their cars, you know, in isolation, and then we're able to text them or call them um, at, the time of, uh, at the time of their appointment so that they're not waiting in a crowded waiting room with other um, patients, um, you know, and, 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 you know, are not associated with any risk uh, because of that. So um, that's been the biggest um, operational change that we've had, uh, you know, in, in our waiting rooms, and it's been met with, um, with high success and, and uh, has been applauded by our patients. Okay. In addition to that, John, um, other measures that we're taking once patients are in our facilities of course, all of our employees will be uh, masked and gowned, have gloves. We're putting in shields at our front desk, plastic shields, uh, to further separate uh, the, the patients from our employees. Um, in addition to the virtual waiting rooms, we're uh, very much pushing on remote scheduling and registration so that patients have to spend less time in our offices um, and I, I want to applaud our IT division, ERAD. This is a, another one of those cases where owning our own IT infrastructure allows us to make these kind of uh, adaptations to the way we want to run our business on a real-time basis rather than having to wait for some vendor to come up with it. Um, in addition to that, we're also going to be scheduling our patients uh, differently uh, so that there is more time in between patients uh, for us to, you know, clean the rooms and make certain that there's uh, less and less uh, interaction between other patients. So I think all of the measures that, uh, that we uniquely can do and that healthcare providers uh, in particular should be doing uh, may allow uh, outpatient imaging to be a very good barometer of uh, the comfort level of uh, reopening some of our communities for patients coming out and feel comfortable that uh, it, it's time to get back to more normal functioning. Great. Um, my other question, kind of shifting gears a little bit, is uh, at what point, uh, I know you're not going to run out and you're going to do a big deal tomorrow, but um, at what point do you think you'll be able to model uh 2021, if, you, if you're looking, let's say somebody comes to you and wants to tell you a bunch of centers, um, when do you think you'd be comfortable saying, yeah, we think we have a handle on 21 numbers and, and we know what would pay for this asset? I think we're going to be able to look at 2021 uh, when we get deeper into the third quarter. Uh, our, our projections uh, for the balance of this quarter and the third quarter um, show some relatively conservative ramping up of patient volumes and revenue, uh, mm -hmm. and that by the fourth quarter we hope to not be all the way back, but certainly um, well on the way to uh, approaching our more expected volumes. So I would think that if we either meet or exceed the projections that we have uh, for the balance of the second quarter and then getting deeper into the third quarter, I realized uh, it will help us in uh, early preparation for our 2021 budget. So I think from the standpoint of monitoring the, the company 
uh, looking at our second quarter results will be extremely important, um, as well as obviously uh, when we can issue our third quarter results. And and then thinking about uh, capital, um, you are you know you're heavily concentrated in a couple of states, uh, you know California, and New York, that are probably going to be on the conservative end of opening up. Um, is, is that a, is the political risk? Something, if you think about it, is that is that a consideration when you're looking at maybe we look at a couple states that uh, that don't have don't have you know that type of governance or, is, or not really? Well, actually, uh, California uh, is leading the way, I think, both on a national scale and certainly uh, by our own numbers uh, in not having seen the same level of decrease in volumes. Uh, and and uh, proceeding more rapidly in the recovery uh, than the East Coast. So I think um, the California experience is one that has been particularly gratifying, and it's also the one where we have the most, uh, the majority, 90 plus percent of our capitation revenues. All of the medical groups that we capitate with uh, are starting to uh, reopen their offices. Uh, actually this month, so we expect those volumes to go up. And when we talk about capitation, I want to remind everybody that all of our medical groups see fee-for-service patients in addition to the HMO capitated lives and are very much a uh, uh, harbinger of where our overall volumes will be. So uh, at least in California, can uh, we expect to have a much more rapid recovery uh, and I, I think the uh, effectiveness of both uh, the governor of uh, uh, California and uh, the mayor uh, have been successful in uh, reducing the spread of the virus and certainly the, num- the number of fatalities. Um, New York is a little bit more, New York and northern New Jersey are a little bit more of a wild card. Uh, simply because of the density of the population, the, uh, the requirement for public transportation, but uh, uh, Governor Cuomo and uh, Governor Murphy, I think it is, in New Jersey, if I'm correct, um, right. have done an excellent job of bringing that down, and I'm uh, very uh, uh, happy to see that our volumes, which had dipped down to almost 90% reduction in in New York, uh, have begun a nice, steady recovery over the last 10 to 12 days. And I suspect that as the uh, uh, shelter at home and uh, we in phase one uh, get introduced here, uh, probably the end of this week, uh, we will expect those uh, uh, businesses, that business in those regions to uh, increase. As far as uh, our two other major markets, Delaware and uh, Maryland, I'm happy to report that last week the governor of uh, Maryland um, uh, opened up uh, the non-emergent procedures, particularly uh, mammography, to be uh, reinstituted. So we expect to see a fairly uh, aggressive uh, increase in screening mammography, which only got further emphasized in terms of its importance uh, with the article that came out in the uh, journal Cancer uh, Today, which was uh, a very, uh, you know, for RadNet that has over 20% of its volume uh, in mammography, uh, particularly gratifying. Great. That's it for me. Thank you. All right, John. Take care. Stay well. And gentlemen, with no other questions, I'd like to turn things back to you all for any closing remarks. Uh, again, I would like to take this opportunity to thank all of our shareholders and stakeholders for their continued support and the employees of WebNet for their dedication and hard work. Management will continue its endeavor to be a market leader that provides great services with an appropriate return on investment for all of our stakeholders. Thank you for your time today. I look forward to our next call. Stay well and be safe. And again, that will conclude today's conference. Thank you all for joining us.